And it's interesting to read what the Bible says about the scriptures or the scriptures say about the Bible. I don't know how you say that. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I go back and pick up the words, all scripture is profitable. And I trust that this study in Ezekiel has been profitable to you for instruction in righteousness. It's not an easy passage to read. It doesn't flow off your mind and tongue like some of the, quote, more familiar passages. But it is the Word of God and... The Lord Jesus Christ said, They are they which testify of me. And he did say that all the prophets, as well as the Psalms and so forth, concerned him. And so all I know to do is to be faithful to God. Uh, I was taught when I was young, whatever mama puts on the table, you eat it. And you may not like something that's on your plate, but you ain't leaving that table till you at least take a bite of it. And don't call the dog around there to where you're sitting because she's wise to that trick. <clears throat> okay, our Father has put this on our plate. Let's gnaw on it, chew on it, tenderize it, and do our best to swallow it down. Because it is profitable and it does reveal the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The most amazing thing that I have seen in this yet is in verses 4 and 5. And that's when I went overtime Sunday. By the way, I don't owe you any more time. I gave you back 15 minutes for the 10 minutes that I, let, that I went over for a Sunday morning. But... The most amazing thing that I've seen so far, to me personally, is the word also in verse number five. The words or the phrase, out of the midst, is seen three times in verses four and five. So there's two things that came out of the midst. One of them is the revelation of God. And in that same fire, Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. The word also in verse 5 said there's one more coming out. The lady said, I'm glad that that birth is over. I'm glad that I was able to have a successful birth. And then another pain hits her and they said, was you expecting twins? And she said, no. They said, but you better now because there's another one coming out. There's twins in this, in this uh, passage, verses 4 and 5. God in the fire in verse 4, and all the elect of God coming out of the fire, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And when we see God on the throne in verse 26, it said it, there was the likeness of the appearance of a man above upon it how long have you existed if you are God's elect you have existed in his love from before the foundation of the world we were chosen in Christ Jesus from before the foundation of the world then how does he show us that but in the very first two people created to stand on planet Earth, Eve had been around as long as Adam had been. Because as long as Adam had been, there was the rib that God would take out of Adam and build a woman. So she had been as long as Adam had been. You have been as long as Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, I should say it that way. Has been. God loved us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. That's amazing. Verse 15 is where we start tonight. Now I beheld the living creatures. 
the living creatures we find are the cherubim, or the cherubim actually are the living creatures we find in chapter 10 and verse 20 of this book. The uh, cherubim are the living creatures. The living creatures are the cherubim. And it said, I beheld the living creatures, that is the new creation in Christ Jesus. It's the life of God seen in the soul of man in the old economy before God says it is finished on the cross, having completed justification. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like the color of a barrel, and they four had one likeness. And their appearance and their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. They didn't have to turn. They had the man's face in front and the calf's uh, face on one side and the lion's face on the other and then the living, the uh, soaring eagle in the rear. So it doesn't matter which way God sends his people. They are fully equipped to take any providence he gives and sends their way. It doesn't matter if nobody else is going that way, if that's the way God is leading you, whether he is leading you as a submissive, sacrificial calf or a benevolent, intelligent Man, or the boldness of a lion, or soaring with God in the heavenlies as an eagle. You are equipped to go in any direction God sends you in because there's a face going north, south, east, and west. So wherever God says go, you're already facing that direction. God is so good. As for their rings, verse 18 talking about the wheels, the uppermost part of the wheels. They were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. Listen, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Now, the living creatures are the life of God within the soul of man. The wheels are the providences of God, the changes in life, the history of the church that which God presents to you in your life each day. And to get this, verse 20, is, is, will be very helpful, beneficial, and it, it will help you in a lot of ways understanding that God will not bring any providence upon you but that which you are equipped to handle. Right. Because the life... In the creature is the Holy Spirit, and the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. We will get into that further tonight. You are here tonight to learn some very deep and practical instructions as how God has devised you and how God has made sure that nothing will be too strong or too powerful against you. That all things, let that seek in, all things will work together for your good because you love the Lord and you are the called, watch it now, according to his purpose. So he has laid out 
history. All the providences that shall come upon the church are structured by that portion of the church that are in that particular providence at that time. He has, he has set forth the times before appointed and the bounds of your habitation so that this particular age is the best age for your character that God has assigned you and for your faith that God has equipped you with to be exercised, developed, and brought on to perfection so that you will be glorified and be like him for you shall see him as he is. There's nothing in this world that is designed to hurt you and there's nothing in this world that you can't handle as you understand the life of the living creatures is in the providence of God. Let's see what we have here. He said, as I beheld the living creatures, behold one of the wheels. I beheld one of the wheels. Verse 15, to have your attention drawn to the living creature, you immediately, in verse 15, also not only beheld the living creatures, but you behold one, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. So we see that the cause and purpose of life's changes are seen in regards to God's elect. You have read, you've heard me read, you've heard different ones read to you. You believe it, Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27, I already quoted it. The times before appointed. What does that mean? God appointed you to live in this day and age, and he, he appointed this day and age to be what it is exactly for you to be exercised and brought to maturity in Christ Jesus. The times before appointed, the bounds of your habitation that you might seek the Lord. God is in this thing. And immediately in verse 15, when you see the life of God in the soul, you see that which represents providence, the wheels that are round about them. First Samuel chapter 10, verse number 6. First Samuel chapter 10 and verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, would you read me the next phrase? And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, Did you hear what you read? The harlot church has made us think that we're here to serve occasion. But God says occasion is here to serve us. What are you going to do in that difficult situation? There's usually only one thing you can do. Trust God and go on through it. And God will show you what his intent was. Do as occasion serve thee. Why? The last phrase, please. God is in you. God is with you. God is in the world governing all things. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. Who will not permit you to be attempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. If you've got a hard thing to go through, 
then you've got the faith that God has given you to be able to handle it. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. The middle of that verse says, God is faithful. That's what the last phrase says, for God is with us. God will not permit. He will not let a demon, a devil, a friend, a neighbor, an enemy, the IRS, or anything else tempt you above that you're able. But they will have to act upon you according to God's determination that your faith should be tried and that you might come forth more mature and stronger because the providence, the wheel, is connected to the living creature, God's people. The spirit in the, in the, in the living creature is the spirit in the wheel. Can't be any other way. God has designed it that way. Judges 9. Judges 9. And verse 33. Judges 9.33 And it shall be that in the morning as soon as the sun is up. Does the weatherman do that? Can you do that? Is it just the rotation of the planets? A godless universe that just does that? Is that just something science has got in order? No. What is that? The sun coming up. That's God's work. Thou shalt rise early. How would you get out of bed this morning? It was God's mercy. And set upon the city. The sun sets upon the city. And behold, when he and the people that is with him come out against thee. Next word. Then mayest thou do to them how? The first part of that verse is God's work. The second part of that verse is your opportunity to act in that work. God is all around you. There is no place from which God is excluded. You are incorporated in God. In Him we live. In Him we move. In Him we have our being, the apostle said. God is not just in the world. The world is in God. You get up in the morning, the sun's up, God's doing his work, it rises upon the city, you're able to get out of bed, God did his work, now what's, what's your work? The just shall live by faith. You go out and you do as occasion serveth you. And when you pray, you don't say, Lord, I've set aside this day to do thus and so. You say, Lord, as far as I'm concerned, I've set aside this day to do this, thus and so, if it is your will. But not my will, but thine be done. And help me as I have faces on all four directions, that whatever comes, that my eagle man or my calf Man or, or the, 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 the human uh, man about me or whatever it is will be able to go in the direction that you have devised for me and even if it's absolutely contrary to anything I even imagined, I will be able to sit back down on the edge of this bed tonight and say, thank you, Lord. You led me through it all and the wheels were governed by the living creature. Because God had made it one. Do you like that? That helps me. That helps me. Isn't that good? Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And verse number 9. I hate to show all this orange. Brother David will have a conniption. But I am burning up up here in this sweater. 
Hold on to him, Brenda. Ecclesiastes 1, 9. Now, how is providence listed in Ezekiel 1, 15 and 16? How is it listed? There is the living creature, and beside it there is the wheel. And the wheels on the bus go round and round, right? You got it? All right. Ecclesiastes 1, 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. There is a saying that says, if you don't learn by history, you are bound to repeat its mistakes. The thing which hath been, it is that which shall be. It's coming around again. And that which is done is that which shall be done. Listen. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? No. Nope. It has been already of old times, which was before us. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 15. That which hath been is now. And that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth, finish it. Are you like them apples? Listen, your great granddaddy and grandmama used to ride to church in a buggy, in a horse and buggy. And you say, well, we're more advanced than that. You're going to be doing the same thing they was doing. The devil ain't got no new bag of tricks and God brings everything back around again because he exercises his people in the same exact way even though we're advancing more and more towards eternity. I look at time not as a washer or a lifesaver or a tire but as a screw because as it comes round and round again it's progressing out to the point to where it will deliver us into eternity. If you don't like that, throw it away. <clears throat> Listen, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and re God requires that which is past. Chapter 6 in verse number 10. You need to kind of study this one. Ecclesiastes 6.10 That which hath been is named already and it is known that it is man. That which is named already is just man. Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. That which hath been is just man being exercised by the providences of God. Hopefully they are the living creatures, those who are born again and have Christ in them. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So you will learn as you go through these things, and God will not allow them to, uh, to hurt you or, you or will not allow you not to be able to, to live in it. All right, Ezekiel 1, 13. How does one know what to do? How does one know then what to do? I've already answered it, but let's go through it again. Ezekiel 1.13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. How was it that the three Hebrew children didn't get burned up in the Babylonian fire? God made their persons, I don't know how to say it, to be children of the fire. Our God is a consuming fire. You saw in Ezekiel 1, verse 4 and 5, out of the same fire, verse 4, comes God, and out of verse 5, also out of the fire comes the elect people of God. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps 
What did Jesus say you were? I'll give you one. You're the salt of the earth. What else are you? Light of the world. Well, if I understand it correctly, light not only has illumination, but it also has heat. Right? And like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. What does that mean? It means that the Holy Ghost is in you. It is constantly alive within you. It is never, I hate saying it, he is never dormant. He is always illuminating, warming, and making you understand the mind and purposes of God as they are needed in a present situation. Because faith is a present trust in God. And the just shall live by faith. I can tell you what you are to do in every situation. Are you ready? Trust God. How did you get this far? Trusted God. Well, some of that stuff back there, stuff that really made you have a knot in your stomach and a lump in your throat? Yes. Well, some of it really hard to face and you wonder why did God make me have to go through this yes are you here today did you make it through it yes is God is going is God going to change no he has put his spirit not only to be with you but to be in you and that fire constantly animates you and causes you to be able to know how to live as occasion serveth thee. John 14. John 14. Verses 16 and 17. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father... And he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. I've got to go. I am the comforter, but I'm leaving you. But the next comforter is coming. He will never leave you. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him. Finish it out for me. Jesus said, I will be with you all the way, even to what? Has the world ended yet? Then two choices. Either God's still with us or he's a liar. He ain't a liar. He's still with us. He's talking to the entirety of the church. I will be with you all the way, even to the end of the world. That church which is down there at the end of the world, I'm going to be with them. Those that's on the way to that place, yeah, I'll be with them. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's how they know what to do. Chapter 16 and verse 13. How do we know what to do? We follow the Spirit of God within us. Chapter 16 and verse 13. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into... You're never going to not know. Wow, my English teacher would bonk me on the head. That's a double socko cracker jack. I don't know. Inhale, inhale all them knots. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of or from himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that is, hear God the Father and the Son say, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Get out of your prophecy mode when you read that. You need to know how to live tomorrow. Do you know yet how to live tomorrow? How are you going to know how to live tomorrow? He's going to show you things to come. When tomorrow gets here, he'll show you how to live tomorrow. 
That's what it's talking about. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he, the Holy Spirit, shall take of mine that I've got from the Father and shall show it unto you. Is that good? Do you remember our verses in Isaiah chapter 30? You say, I don't know yet. Okay, let me get you over there. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 20. Woo, my perspiration is beginning to ice over. <laughs> we go from hot to icy cold. Isaiah 30 and verse 20. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, who gave you the bread of, the, of adversity? The Lord. Okay? Now, how much bread is he going to give you? Enough for you to need the water of affliction. Yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes, and remember those wheels, were full of eyes. But thine eyes shall see thy teacher. Now, I would like for you to read for yourself verse 21. What if you turn to the right hand? Well, I got a face over there. What if you turn to the left? That's all right. God's got me equipped that wherever, whichever way God leads me, it's the way God wants me to go, and I'm equipped to go that way. Turning to the right hand or to the left doesn't make any difference. Those things that you used to do in times past, you can't set them down as those things which are ironclad, and that's the formula by which we shall live our life. No. The just shall live by faith. faith, not by a pre-scheduled or pre-programmed concept of life. You promise yourself a smooth ride when you have youngins, and you grab a verse, train up a child in the way he should go, and the end he will not depart from it. And he didn't say anything about the middle. Hello? Right? You're going to turn to the left hand and right trying to do that. You can't have a formula. You can't have, you know, a schedule program, a concept of how this thing works. One and one don't equal two in walking with God. Two shall be one, God said. It's got to be by faith. But you need to understand, the Spirit of God that's in you is the Spirit of God that's in providence. He will lead you through it. He will take care of you. Has he not given his only son? How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Every time you get in a bind, look at Calvary. He gave us the dearest and most precious thing in the world. The God-man. The blood of God was in his veins and he emptied them for me. So why would he want to let you stump your toe? Unless stumping your toe was something you needed to get your attention. Right? See, this is very practical, isn't it? The wheels and so forth. Now, remember that verse, Isaiah 30, verse 21. You need to put that, hang it from your rearview mirror on your car and put it under one of them magnets on your refrigerator if you've got any room left from all them drawings that little darling has 
handed you and you stuck up there? Oh, I see some of them snickering. Remember that. Now, in Ezekiel 1, what color are the wheels? What difference does it make, Brother Gene? Well, God don't put nothing in here just for filler. Ezekiel 1.16. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel. And their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now, we've had amber. And we've, we see burnished brass in verse 7. There are other colors mentioned. What are we to understand from the word barrel? Exodus 28 and verse 20. Let's start with verse 15 to make sure we understand where we are. Exodus 28, 15. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment. That's what we're talking about. This is what they're supposed to do, make the breastplate of judgment. And it tells you how to do it. And we get on down uh, to the setting of the stones. In verse 17, four rows of stones. Look at verse 20. And the fourth row, a barrel. What does that mean? This thing, you can never, ever let your mind lose the awareness that this thing is not the color of earth. Well, we talk about earth tones, browns and greens and so forth. It's not earth tones. It's not common. It's not earthy. It's not happenstance. It's not chance. They didn't do this to me. This is handed to me by God. It is a color that is born on the high priest's breast when he goes in before God and that lampstand beams off of that jewel just like it does off all the others. And the Holy of Holies is amazing as the light is reflected off of the lampstand and beams out all the colors. And God would not have it to be so without the barrel. And that's the color of the wheel. Your life, though you say it's just humdrum, it doesn't mean anything. It means something to God. And your providences are not only round so that you learn some things, the things which has been is that which is now. You learn some things. You say, uh-oh, I know about this. You're able to caution others who have not your experience. You're able to govern yourself and work carefully and closely with the Holy Ghost because the wheels are round. But they also have a color, not only a shape, but a color. And that color is that which God requires or the breastplate of the high priest could not be acceptable before Almighty God. What kind of stone is a barrel? I don't know. They said it, it's like a, they think it's a topaz. Well, that don't do me no good. But anyhow, all I know is it has to be on the breastplate. And God takes off of his breast where his heart beats and puts it in your providence and says, this is the way. Walk ye therein. 
Ten thousand may fall at thy side and a thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh to thee. There shall not be a hair of your head that's going to perish. You come on and walk with me. But Lord, that's through the valley of death shade. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? One reason. For thou art with me. This is designed to give you a personal relationship with the person of God. You're going to find out that all your Christian books, though they have been a great help, all your devotions, though they have been a great help, all of your brothers and sisters, all of the gifts of the church, though they have been a great help, the only thing that ever gets you through is your personal trust in the personal God. And he says, be careful for nothing. That's the 1611 translation in, from the Greek. What does it mean? Be anxious for nothing. There will be things that will make you blow your deodorant. There will be things that make you chew your fingernails. There will be things that make your blood pressure go up. But there will never be anything that will overcome you. And there will never be anything in which God will fail you if you put your trust in him. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart to thine own in thy ways acknowledge and he shall direct thy paths wait a minute now wait a minute wait a minute he the person of God is interested in the person of you he didn't save you on the buddy system he saved you because he wanted to save you he brought you to himself personally individually and he shall direct thy paths. You know, when you get in a car and somebody else is driving, you kind of want to know what kind of driver they are. Well, you ain't got to worry about this. He's been driving the whole universe from long before me and you ever was thought of. And you know how many directs he's had? You know how many mistakes he's made? You know how many mishaps he's had? You know how many times he's got a ticket and had to go to court? You say, that's pretty good. No, that's perfect. That ain't pretty good. That's perfect. And he ain't about to start failing now. He will direct your path. The wheel is connected to the living creature. The spirit in the living creature is in the wheels. Isn't that good? Now, it says in verse 16, Ezekiel chapter 1, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel. And they four had what? One likeness. Isn't that good? And their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. They four had one likeness. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Verse 14. Ecclesiastes 2.14. The wise man's eyes are in his, he in his head, but the fool walketh in, the, in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Verse 15. Then said I in my heart, as it happened to the fool, so it happeneth unto, even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, that this also is vanity. It said that they 
they four had one likeness. Dear soul, the thing that happens to others will be that which happens to you. They had one likeness. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Verse number 11. And I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men, to men of skill. Read me the rest of it. There ain't nobody doing no better than you are. There's not anybody any better off than you are. What are you doing looking at them anyhow? You're supposed to be looking to the Lord. They're all of one likeness. They are one. No temptation taking you but such as is common to man. Dear soul, the reason that nobody else is going to be doing any better than you is because they don't have anybody but God and faith to help them either. Oh, if I had... Don't even finish the sentence. God made you because he needed you to be you. He wants to act like you to act like you. He wants you to understand that you are important to him. Time and chance happens to everybody. But the thing about it is, dear soul, God is walking with those who are his elect. And it matters to him because he loves you. And he don't want anything to happen to you except that which is ordained of God to bring you to a higher level of spiritual consciousness so that you might enjoy him more. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Verse number 7. I don't want to get into a big quagmire here. I just want to read this verse, okay? So you Bible, Bible scholars don't come after me about Cain and Abel. I just want to read this verse. And you just take it for what it says. Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thou countenance fallen? Verse 7, If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? Is that the Bible? Don't tell me about elect, not elect. I'm just telling you what God said to Cain. And I'm telling you that time and chance happen to everybody. And God will ask us the same question. If we do well, shall we not be accepted? What is doing well? Believing on the Son. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. I ain't going no farther with that. I just want that question. God, if God asked Cain that, and he is no respecter of persons, if God asked you that, what is your answer? You, you have every opportunity to be Ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect as anybody ever has. As much as David or Abraham or John or Peter or James. God's not any different for you than he was to them. Time and chance happens to everybody. How do you know what to do? I already told you. Trust God. Listen to that inner voice, that light, that fire, that flame that comes within you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. He's going to take care of you. How would he give his only begotten son 
and then fail you in any other way. Now, Ezekiel 1, 18. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful. The rings, it's the same word, the higher place in Ezekiel 43, 13. So the rings are the highest part of the wheel. This thing comes up in the highest part of the wheel, the providence of God sometimes, dreadful. How dreadful is it? Matthew 16. When I finish it, when I stop, you finish the rest of the verse, okay? Matthew 16, 27. Are we there yet? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father and with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. How dreadful is providence in the life of the believer. It is that which shall give the Lord Jesus Christ the opportunity to bless you for that work. I can't tell you what to do in your personal Christian life. You can't tell me what to do in my personal Christian life. It wouldn't be faith if we could. You say you just told us you could tell us how to... Uh, what to do in every situation yeah trust God but specifically I have never ever tried to be a counselor ever there was three men came in here one day when we were having those preachers fellowship meetings and they said we want to come in and be a member of your church and we want you to counsel us and I said you're in the wrong place they left and I ain't never seen them well I, one of them I did I said, you need God to be your counselor, and the way you get God to be your counselor is listening to the preaching of the word and receive it as the Holy Spirit applies it to your heart. God will take care of you, not me. I ain't got sense enough sometimes to get in out of the rain. God knows how to, let, to take care of you. The voice within you, not the voice outside, says, this is the way walk ye therein. These wheels are dreadful. Why is it dreadful? Because you're going to be judged by your works. These providences will reveal whether you are trusting in the Lord or not. That's why they're dreadful. It's awesome. I like to get stoned at a Sovereign Grace Bible conference when I read Matthew 24. And told them that this is the way God will judge his people. And not by whether their names were written in Calvin's book or not. What did it say? According to your works. What? For you said, here's a man that's naked. I give him clothes. Here's a man that's hungry. I fed him. Here's a man that was sick. I tended to him. Here's a man that was in prison. I visited him. Come into the joys of my father. What? The works are dreadful. It's unbelievable. I didn't do that in order to show anything about me. It just... From the fire that was within me and the revelation and the leadership of God just seemed to be the right thing to do. That's why they're so dreadful. Every man should be judged according to his works. And what are your works? It's your relationship to providence. And what is providence seen to be here? The wheel. And why is that of the wheel dreadful? Because it's the highest part. <laughs> And it'll bring you into the presence of the glory of Almighty God. Dear friend, I, 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 I want to stay right with God in, in instructing you. 
Let me go ahead and say it. There's been times in my life when I have been depressed and down and just absolutely felt like just ministry was just useless. And things were bad and things were happening to me that I didn't like and I couldn't take them and it just, I just ready to go eat worms and die. And God would put somebody in my life that needed something, a word, a verse, a comfort, an encouragement. And God would help me and allow me to be part of that voice that said, this is the way, walk you therein to them. And all of a sudden, that fire would be going up and down in the living creature. And I would walk away, and this is the part I didn't want for you to be wrong, get me wrong about. There was a warmth and a joy in my soul and the Holy Spirit whispered to me, you see, son, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I bowed my head and worshiped God, and, and I repented that I'd ever been depressed and down, but I thanked God Almighty for allowing me to be some bit of a conduit through which he poured his encouragement and and the unit went on his way rejoicing. And I was carried by the Spirit to the next place I was to minister to. The wheels are dreadful. It's where you get to take God's part. For God so loved the world that he, and it is more blessed to than to receive and you were able to do that in the providences mm, wheels on the bus go right you were able to do that in the providence of God so you were able to look and peer into the glories of God with, light, with eyes all the way around that wheel and the rings were dreadful and you saw Lord have mercy maybe God has saved me God has allowed me to be an extension of his of his work and 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 he is the vine and I am a branch and the fruit does appear because the root provides all the nourishment that I need. Wow. The rings are dreadful. 2 Timothy 2:14. No, it ain't. It's 2 Timothy 4.14. We may get there and find out it ain't even there. Let's just look and see. Yep. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Read me the rest of it. He doesn't say, Lord... Smack him down, shame him, strip him naked and run him through the streets. He said, the Lord reward him according to his works. When saw we thee, inasmuch as ye did it, enter into the joy of the Lord? You mean to tell me I get to enter into the joy of the Lord and, and the others are going to enter into the darkness prepared for the devil and his angels because they did not the works? Yes. That's why the wheels are so dreadful. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Somebody needs something, you give him Full measure, pressed down, running over. You take care of him. And you're delighted to do so. And God said, all right, give me that ruler. What are you going to do with it, Lord? He said, you know how you measured out to him? Yeah, I'm keeping this. That's how I'm going to measure back to you. 
and as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. Why? Because the wheels and the rings are dreadful, and God will reward you according to your works in providence. Let's finish out. First Corinthians chapter 3. I didn't read you the verse that goes with it. You stay there, 1 Corinthians 3. I'll be right there in just a minute. Ezekiel 1, 19. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Sometimes God raised you up from earthly things. Rise up, O men of God, have done with earthly things. That which is of the earth is earthy. God will raise you up to a spiritual mindedness and consciousness. Providence will also work with you in that. Everything will be as God has ordained it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 22. Last part of verse 21. For all things are yours. You don't believe that. If you don't believe that, then I've wasted my time tonight and you had not heard anything I said. You can't go out of here doubting and, and failing to trust God like you were before you came in here. You, you've heard God say, I'm with you. Not your preacher, not your granny, not your mother, not the deacon, but me, God Almighty. I am with you. I am with you. Listen. For all things are yours, whether Paul, an apostle, or Apollos, an evangelist, or Cephas, Peter. Listen, read me the next three words after Cephas. Or the world. Wait a minute. Don't read it if you don't believe it. All things are yours, and one thing that he mentions is the world. That means that God has ordained all providence for it to come to pass in exactly the time that that segment of the church then living in that providence needs it so that they might act out their faith and grow in grace and the knowledge of God. The world is yours. God didn't make the world so the little birds could fly in the atmosphere and the fish could swim in the water. God made the world for you. Amen. What's the next two words? Right. Mm. What, what kind of life? It don't say. If it says the world, <laughs> it's a, life can't just mean, you know, you and your, your two it means everything and anything that has life is here to be subservient to you in your walking in the providence of God with the Holy Spirit in you and knowing that it is designing your providence. And listen to the next one. Or death. Dying with Jesus through death reckon mine. Whew. Buried with him in baptism. I tried to go by the funeral home Sunday afternoon. Got a call from the Tyrone headquarters. And Diane said, I just blacked out and I hit the floor. I said, you all right? She said, yeah. She said, I got cake batter all over the walls. I was making you a cake. And I blacked out and I pulled the, what you call that thing? The mixer up out of the batter and she slung batter everywhere. 
I said, leave it alone. I'll lick it off when I get home. <laughs> she had already cleaned it up. She said, you go on by the funeral home. I said, okay. So there wasn't hardly a parking place. And I finally found one and went in. No, I didn't go in. I went up to the door and a man said, are you here for the Gilbert family? I said, yes, sir. He said, sign this register out here or get in that line. It'll be two hours. I said, I'll sign right here. And I thought about Timothy and Heather losing the six-year-old daughter. Perfectly fine on Monday, dead on Thursday. And I thought about what Brother Jamie read us Sunday from her words. And I thought, Lord, she's just as much your daughter as Riley was Timothy and Heather's daughter. And that there was a need for the wheel to be raised up and the eyes and the ring to be dreadful in that there was a necessity in the infinite wisdom and love of Almighty God for God to remove that little flower and bring it on home to him so that these might have a deeper appreciation for the world and life and death. Hard thing, but a good thing. Could not that be considered in all things that work together for the good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose? Yes. Is not that ring dreadful? Yeah. If I'd ever made it in there, I, I couldn't say I know how you feel because I don't know how they feel. But God said the world, life, and death, now listen, are things present. Boy, I wish we was living back yonder. No, you don't. God makes things present. While you're present in the world, God makes providences that are present in the world. The world, just exactly like it is, is exactly the goldfish bowl you need to swim in. Just like the fish swims in water, you are in this providence. This is where you thrive. This is where God in his infinite wisdom has placed you, having given you the, the measure of faith that you need to live in it and to exercise yourself thereby so that you might stand before God in all of his glory and hear, well done, thou good and faithful. He ain't going to say, well done, thou good and successful servant, because God can't be unsuccessful. The whole issue of well, the church is the just shall live by faith. by faith. Well done, thou good and full of faith, servant, faithful. Because when the wheels raised up, so did you. Are things present? Are things to come? And would you read me the last three words of verse 22? Oh, you believe that? Don't you dare not believe that? And you're Christ, and Christ is God. God don't have no surprises. He's already out you in tomorrow. There wouldn't be a tomorrow if God wasn't already in it. God dwells in past, present, and future. But tomorrow may surprise me and you. But it ain't going to shake us off our foundation because our foundation is Christ. And we'll do what we've always done. Help me, Jesus. Is that it?